you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Everyone, I'm Lana Zak. It is great to be with you. Unfortunately, the U.S. has once again shattered its daily record of new coronavirus infections. More than 77,000 new cases were reported on Thursday. Some states have reached new daily highs. More than 3.5 million people have been infected nationwide, while the death toll has now topped 138,000. Danya Bacchus has the latest. Texas has brought in coolers and refrigerated trailers to store bodies as their morgues fill up. This is a morbid topic. Uh, these individuals are our family members and, and friends. Following a third straight day of topping 10,000 COVID infections, Texas announced 5 million public school students may start classes online this fall. Florida reported more than 11,400 new cases Friday. I think the fact that we're testing so much has led to case numbers that have been put out there and I think kind of unfairly uh, you know, maligning the state. More than half the states have mask mandates. Georgia is not among them, although several cities have their own ordinances. The governor is suing Atlanta's mayor, saying her mask requirement violates his state order. Jury people need to wear a mask. You know, I don't think it takes a mandate for people to do the right thing. But Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, who recently tested positive for coronavirus, says her order stands and she'll see the governor in court. When you are reckless, as the governor has been, when you disregard science, as the governor has done, then certainly people are suffering and people are dying in our state. Indoor dining is prohibited in California as COVID cases continue to surge. Here in Burbank, Parts of the city's busiest downtown streets are closed so restaurants can expand their outdoor dining. It allows for these uh, restaurants to, you know, get more business. I, th I think it's awesome. Nail and hair salons are closed in California. Owners are asking the governor to allow them to do their business outdoors. Danya Back is CBS News, Los Angeles. A private government report says some states may need to take drastic steps to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Natalie Brand is at the White House with the very latest. As U.S. coronavirus cases shattered another record Friday, a White House task force document obtained by the Center for Public Integrity suggests states with surging cases should return to more stringent precautions. The document lists 18 states in the so-called red zone for caseloads. It recommends that red zone counties require masks at all times, close bars and gyms, and limit social gatherings to small groups. We've got to have a delicate balance of carefully and prudently going towards normality and opening up at the same time that we contain and not allow these surgings that we're seeing in certain southern states. That's a big challenge. On Capitol Hill this morning, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said negotiations will begin next week on the next round of COVID relief legislation. I think we'll definitely have another package. During testimony, he also said the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses should be extended to help the hardest hit industries, including restaurants and hotels. I think this time we need to have a revenue test and make sure that money is going to businesses that have significant revenue declines. The White House and lawmakers are also talking about tens of billions of dollars in school funding as a priority in the next round of COVID relief. Last week, the president threatened to withhold federal funding from schools that do not reopen. The CDC has delayed the release of its additional guidance for reopening schools safely. The agency had said it would be out this week, but now says it'll be released by the end of July. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the White House. A Russian-backed hacking group is believed to have targeted organizations working on a coronavirus vaccine. Charlie Daggett is in London, where the world's leading clinical trials might be at risk. Intelligence agencies say the hackers have been at it for months, trying to steal vital vaccine research. Finally, the British government said enough. 
I think it's important to call it out because we're not going to wait until there is harm. It's clearly wrong, uh, contrary to international law. Targeting labs and medical facilities in the UK, US and Canada, identifying the group as APT29 for Advanced Persistent Threat, codename Cozy Bear. The former director of GCHQ, Britain's version of the NSA, Robert Hannigan. And let's be clear, these aren't common criminals. We're talking about state-backed hackers. They are state-based actors. And very often they're people in state agencies you know, un under a different name. So there's a direct link between these groups and the Russian state. Cozy Bear has been accused of hacking into the DNC and stealing emails ahead of the 2016 election. Both the NSA and British agents say the group is almost certainly an arm of Moscow's intelligence services. Russia is suffering from one of the worst COVID outbreaks in the world. Plenty of incentive to find a vaccine and pull off an international coup. The Kremlin has denied any wrongdoing, and as any vaccine will be shared worldwide, one Russian pharmaceutical CEO said, why would we steal what's going to be given to us anyway? These hacking allegations come at a critical time. Important developments about the Oxford vaccine are about to be made public. The British officials won't say whether any information was stolen, but they say no damage has been done. And for more on this, CBS News senior investigative correspondent Catherine Herridge joins me now. Catherine, great to see you on a Friday. So how have U.S. officials responded to word of this attack and what are they doing to try and prevent further hacking attempts? I think one of the most important things they've done, Lana, is that they are publicly calling out Russian intelligence with this joint statement from the United Kingdom, the U.S., and the Canadian intelligence services. And I want to draw your attention to a very specific part of the statement. And it reads, in part, the U.K., the United Kingdom, will continue to counter those conducting these attacks and work with our allies to hold perpetrators to account. So when you read the tea leaves here, a public statement like this is designed to build the public case against Russian intelligence and lay the groundwork for public sanctions or even covert action, like a retaliatory cyber attack. They call that classic gray zone warfare. And Catherine, what exactly linked the hacks back to the Russian government? And is this concrete or is that likely to continue to be disputed among some parts of our government? Well, based on my experience reporting in this national security space for two decades, when there's a public attribution, they feel the intelligence is very solid, and in this case, linking back to the GRU or Russian intelligence. Uh, this particular type of hack is something called an A. PT-29, Advanced Persistent Threat. That means that they use phishing emails typically to harvest your credentials, so your login information, your password. And then once they're inside a network, they're usually sort of quiet for a while. They expand their reach, and then they start stealing information, what forensics call exfiltrating data. And what's key about this particular method of operation is that it's known as Cozy Bear or Fancy Bear. And if that rings a bell, it's because in 2016, this same group of hackers aligned with Russia are accused of stealing the emails from the DNC, exfiltrating that data, and then eventually releasing them during the 2016 election campaign. Well, what do you make of the claim that you heard in Charlie Daggett's package that Russia that Russia says we wouldn't bother hacking it? We have nothing to gain from hacking it. It's going to be given to it's us so, anyway. So typical. Is there still yeah, a reason? So typical of the Russians. <laughs> so typical. Right. Sorry to interrupt there, but you know the way these things work is that they try and create plausible deniability. So it's not per se the Russian government that's doing it. It's a group that's affiliated with Russian intelligence, and sometimes these are Russian operatives. Sometimes they're cyber criminals for hire. They get a certain amount of money and they have a target. And then in this case, they're looking at this research that is trying to find a vaccine and a way to mitigate COVID-19. The, the reason the Russians do this, Lana, is really for three reasons. Number one, they've got people within their own borders who are very sick with COVID-19, so they want some kind of relief. Number two, they do it for financial gain. They want to understand which vaccine is the most likely to succeed in the future because they can leverage that in the markets, and they want to see which research is the most promising. But the most important is number three, and they do this for national security reasons and to gain leverage 
advantage over other nations. The country that is able to come up with some kind of mitigation or vaccine for COVID-19 is going to have tremendous leverage in the future, not only with its partnerships, but also against its enemies. Well, as the coronavirus vaccine is still in development, and I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say all of us are rooting for these researchers mm -hmm. and these scientists who are working so diligently mm -hmm. on it, mm -hmm. should we be concerned about these hacking attempts potentially harming the study or making mm -hmm. it difficult for these mm -hmm. researchers to do their jobs? Mm -hmm. I don't want to pretend uh, to have inside information about the, in the impact of this particular event. But any time you have a series of attacks, pardon me, a series of attacks that are linked to um, high, high priority research, when you have an attack, you effectively desync it because there's a period of time where they have to do a damage assessment to understand what kind of intelligence was lost. And then they have to do an assessment which allows them to harden the target, if you will. And that would be standard practice. And I would expect it would go on in this case. And apologies for the, the ringing there. <laughs> You know, maybe something important, I'll let you know. <laughs> all right. Catherine Herod, we're all trying to make it work in our own way. Thank you for joining of us. Of course. Thank you, Lana. A new report claims sexual and verbal harassment were common in the upper levels of Washington's NFL team. The Washington Post published the allegations of 15 women against executives. As Nicole Killian reports, the news follows a decision to retire the team's controversial name. It really took most people no time to comment on my appearance. Emily Applegate is one of 15 women who spoke to the Washington Post, describing a culture of sexual harassment and verbal abuse by former members of the Washington NFL team's front office. I was so embarrassed that I was being treated that way in front of people. You know, like if you get called stupid so many times in front of somebody, like that's really embarrassing. Five ex-employees, including some who were part of owner Dan Snyder's inner circle, are accused of inappropriate language and unwanted sexual advances. In one instance, according to the Post, a female staffer allegedly received a text message from Richard Mann, the former assistant head of pro personnel, asking if her breasts were real or fake. He allegedly told the same employee, I want to squeeze your butt. Sexual harassment has just been commonplace in that in that office for upwards of 10 or 15 years. Reporter Will Hobson broke the story. They are subjected to unwanted overtures, uh, inappropriate remarks about you know certain body parts, uh, and then also that on the sales staff, women have been encouraged to dress low cut blouses, tight skirts and, and heels. Welcome back to Redskins Nation. Here One of the officials named veteran play by play announcer Larry Michael retired this week. He was actually caught on a hot mic speaking in a sexual manner about a college age intern. Another personnel executive facing allegations, Alex Santos, was dismissed. Six former employees and two reporters allege he commented on their bodies and asked if they were romantically interested in him. In a statement to the Post, the team said it takes issues of employee conduct seriously. It has also retained a prominent D.C. law firm to conduct a thorough independent review and help the team set new employee standards for the future. What does this mean for Dan Snyder and his organization? This football team is at a crossroads right now. There certainly are a lot of women who are skeptical that the culture can truly change as long as he owns it. Owner Dan Snyder has not been accused of inappropriate behavior. The NFL said the allegations are contrary to its values and pledged to take action when the team's investigation is over. Nicole Killian, CBS News, Landover, Maryland. Coming up after the break, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg announces she's undergoing chemotherapy for a reoccurrence of cancer. We'll have the latest on her condition. Plus, anti-Trump Republican groups are urging GOP voters to back Joe Biden in November. We'll take a look at who's behind these efforts. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.